All right, let me tell you about the most stupidest book I've ever read. And yeah, I said most stupidest. This book has so fried my brain, it has fried my grammar along with it. You see this bottle, okay? Aha, most thrillers have a aha moment, like, oh, all the pieces coming together and stuff like that, and I get it. Not this thriller. It had a, what the living heck was that moment? Second, the worst book I've read this year. How you guys doing? It's me, your girl, you Casey. I, this book destroyed me in the worst possible way. Here it is. Look at its stupid face. I was just minding my own business in the library. I wanted one simple little book to read. Oh, I saw this on the new releases shelf. It looked like a thriller. I picked it up and I read the summary and it seemed pretty cool. Let me summarize for you. So, I don't remember anyone's name in this book besides Daniel and Emily. Is his name Daniel or David? It's David. David's the main guy character. Emily, because you know, the other Emily, she's the titular character. So kind of hard to forget her name. But so our guy, David, he's an author. He's doing very well for himself. He was on his way to live the most beautiful life. Good career, good friends, and he had the love of his life, Emily, as his basically soon-to-be fiance. Now, one thing I mentioned about this book, character development. <clears throat> the only thing that defines David is his obsession and overbearing love for Emily. Just, that's it. So take it from me that his love for this girl is like, mm, kind of unhealthy, it's getting really high up on this chart. So, love of his life. But, so this happened 10 years ago, when they were both 25, <sighs> the blossoming fragrance of a first love at a youthful age. But also during this time, there is this serial killer on the loose. His name is Jessup, I think. What Jessup would do is he'd kidnap girls, take them to his house, you know, do the unpleasantries that a serial rapist would do. Then when he was like, oh, you know, I'll tuck her out from playing with his new toys because his torture dungeons were called playrooms, he would kill him. But it's not just that, no. Jessup is cuckoo, mega cuckoo. When the police finally found his, you know, hideaway, they managed to save four girls who were still alive and chained up. They found the bodies of nine girls, I think, who were like, all wrapped up like a mummy. There was embalming fluid. And so the police guys are like, hey, Mr. Serial Killer Guy, uh, well, what you doing with these mummy girls? And Mr. Serial Killer Guy is like, well, I'm gonna re I'm gonna re-resurrect them so they'll be my brides. Sensible plan, okay. So they take him to jail, they get him to confess, and Jessup confesses that he's captured 27 girls, captured and or killed. So the police officers, they're doing the math. They found nine dead bodies. They saved four girls, nine plus four, 13. 27 minus 13 is 14. So they're like, hey, Jessup, where's the rest of the bodies? And he's like, I ain't telling. I ain't telling. They're my harem. I'm going to resurrect them when I get out of this joint. So yeah, no one's been able to discover where these bodies have been lying for 10 years. What does this have to do with Mr. Ryder guy who's in love with Emily? Emily went missing around that 10 year killing spree. And because there's 14 bodies unaccounted for, everyone, the police, even David the writer guy, they're convinced that she was one of those unlucky victims who are among the nameless victims. So David, in order to like butter Mr. Serial Killer up, he makes like deposits into Jessup's prison bank account. He goes to talk to him and stuff like that under the pretense of writing a book but he's really trying to get confirmation. Like, did you kill Emily? Have you seen this woman before? And Jessup, like this is really the only guy that I'll talk with him. So he's like toying with him and stuff. He's not giving him a straight answer. And so this crazy man is David's last hope and Jessup's not being nice. He's not telling him anything. So for these past 10 years, David's just been, you know, sluggishly slouching through life. No real goals. Like he's still writing, but writer's block and all that. And he's burdened with the depressing memories of what could have been with Emily until one day, 10 years later from the anniversary, or around that time, he goes to a bar, he, he looks around at the clientele like, okay, nice, nice, okay. What is that? There's a lady at the bar and she looks exactly like Emily, like exactly. The Emily from 10 years ago, she would have been around 35 now, but this looks like 25 year old Emily when she went missing. So you bet our David Ryder guy, he's like, what the heck is this thing? So he saw Shays is over and he's like, hey girl, let me get your digits. And sure thing, 
It happens, and then uh, a bunch of junk happens. Let me tell you that right now. Okay, so I want to go over what happened in this book, everything, all the spoilers, because I don't care. I don't care if I spoil you. I mean, I kind of care because I'm telling you right now this is going to be a spoiler review, but you shouldn't read this book. You shouldn't. But in the spirit of non-spoileriness, I will tell you my main gripes with this book, okay? I mentioned it before, no character personalities, okay? And there's too many characters, too many people. I can't keep track of who's who. This is a thriller, but I also need to warn you that it's also science fiction, which is handled very poorly, like another book that suddenly throws in science fiction all of a sudden. The big thriller twist comes out of nowhere. You can't solve it. The buildup is so slow. Most, there's no action in this book. There's a lot of interviews going to, a lot of just sneaking around and oh, I cannot stand being in this guy's head, David, the protagonist, because, okay, I've never, ever had so much trouble reading a book before. I have literally fallen asleep while reading this book. Sleep, books don't make me sleep. I tried reading this book, I kind of dozed off, and when I got done, I got up out of bed, and I went to the bathroom mirror and had mascara just running down my face. Was I crying? No, it's because I was yawning so much, and my attention could not stick to the paragraph. Like, I'd read paragraph upon paragraph and paragraph, but I couldn't understand what was happening. What are we even talking about? Also, during, like, one of the few high tense moments, like, sneaking around, our villain guy is sneaking up behind us. And our guy, David, just is like, oh my gosh, editor, pull it up. You have a picture on the phone that I'm filming with. Yeah, hi, it's the editor. I mean, just look at this. This is a big chunk of paragraph. Right in the middle of a chase scene and our main character is just like monologuing to himself. Like, oh, he knew now that a self-aware and self-critical man, grown past the callowness of youth, would do anything for the object of his love if he felt her to be good and worthy. Not merely die, not merely kill, but kill and die and go to hell for his actions, supposing hell was real and his actions warranted damnation. I'm just, ugh. Like, we are running away from a serial killer guy person thing. Why are you doing this? It's so boring. Yeah, like, hello, pacing. Yeah, we gotta have that. We can't have a monologue during a high tense chase scene. You can't. Honestly, just like poorly, poorly written. Plot, nah, like nothing. I can't even in my my right mind. I don't even want to give this book a one star because that one star is the easiest star to get with me. It's just the writing style. But like I mentioned before, this book made me fall asleep just by the act of it, of me reading the writing. It was awful. So now I'm going to get into the spoily plot reveal. And if you read this book, stay with me. And if you haven't read this book and you know you're not going to read this book, stay with me because you're going to want to hear this, okay? So picking up where we left off, David. No more fiance. She gone, she missing. But he finds a lookalike at a bar, okay? That's where we're gonna pick up now. So spoilers from here on out. And like I mentioned before, I fell asleep many times reading this book, so things are a little blurry. So I'm gonna tell you guys these things as I best remember them. The thing is when I wanna review a bad book, I never know it's a bad book and that I wanna review it until like halfway through the book. Then it's too late to take notes of like the first 200 pages. So now you get my faulty recollections. This is what happens. Okay, so he gave this lookalike her his digits. They chatted up. And she's like, my name is Madison. My favorite color is blue. I love lilies. And like, she just keeps talking and like explaining and telling what, what she likes, what's her personality and stuff like that. And it's exactly the same as Emily's. Strange. And our guy David, he's like listening and looking at her and dead ringer. He's even like, I wonder like if you have that scar she has on her belly button and stuff. Like he's a little freaked out, but intrigued. So conversation ends. David goes back to his house. And I don't remember if he was having a weird, he was having a weird dream. He was having a dream that like Emily was drawing his blood through a needle or something like that. But during this dream, he wakes up and Madison, the Emily lookalike, she's suddenly there in his room. He's not freaked out by this, by the way. He's just like, girl, get on in here. And you know, they, they commence with the lovemaking. And so after that fervorous night, he wakes up, Madison's not in bed. So he goes to the kitchen, she's there wearing his robe and they're making breakfast. And he's like, how did you know where I live? Good question. I can't actually remember if he like gave her his address, but that's not what's most important. What is important is that she got into the house while he was asleep. She knew where the spare key was hidden. So he asked, 
how did you know the spare key was? And she's just sipping her coffee and she's like, oh, one of your books that you wrote, well, your protagonist hid it behind a rocking chair. So I looked behind your rocking chair and the key was there. And David's like, aha, interesting. So this is when my brain like developed the theory that this is like an obsessive fan who's read all of his books and knows about his relationship with Emily and has just like, you know, configured plastic surgeon herself to look like her to be a part of his life. That would have been so cool, man. That is not what happens. But you know, David, he's a little bit unsettled by this, but dang, that was some good sex last night. He doesn't want to throw her out just yet. So he's trying to like, you know, continue some casual conversation. And he's like, so what do you do, Madison? And she's like, I'm an assassin. Oh gosh. Yeah, my crazy fan theory, it escalates from here, but it goes nowhere. So you take it, yeet it. And she's like, yeah, I just eliminate the bad people. And don't worry, you're a good person. And like, they've only known each other for a one night stand kind of thing. And she's already like dropping the L word. Like, I love you, David, so much. And I gotta leave you for a little bit. I have a new target to kill. I'll be back, trust me. And so she gone now. And David's just like, the heck, but not too much the heck. He's like, aw, she's just like Emily. He's like, oh my gosh, I love her. I love her. I got another chance with Emily. I don't care if she is Emily or not Emily. She's enough of Emily to be with me. Oh, you're simping, bro. Mm -hmm. But meanwhile, Madison's out doing her assassination things. A murder does happen to very famous scientists that, where's my notebook? I wrote this down. Oh, I'm using it as the tripod. Hold on. Okay, so this couple, they're very famous scientists and they're, let's see, da 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 da. Oh, I also called the writing style chunky. Like, it's just so thick. No substance, but so thick. Oh, I also need to tell you something that happened on page 171, apparently, because this is like their fifth conversation and this is what we're into right now. I'm a needy creature, Davy, Madison says. We all are. He said, me more than most. I need affection. I need to love air. I need to be loved. You are. I love you. I love you very much. I need to be loved every day, every hour. I know so well the loneliness of being unloved. Until you, I've been starved for love all my life. Surely not, says David. But I have starved. And now I can't get my fill until you. Life was a horror. Need you little witch. That's what you are. Mm -hmm. Okay, back to the scientists. They were brutally murdered like an assassination. And they've been studying this thing called, I'm gonna bungle this whole pronunciation, Arcadia. Basically just like progressing the progression of human stuff like that, ultimate human form, blah, 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 immortality, blah, blah, blah. And some guy developed this science so that he could be young and horny forever. There are so many horny people in this book. I'm like, yo, I get it, it's your drive. Can you put some brakes on real quick? I'm trying to read a story, I don't care about your love life. So the assassination happens, and because, you know, Davy has a, enough common sense to be a little sketched out by Madison, he contacts his private investigator friend. He's like, hey, I need you to look into this girl and try to pull up, you know, her background and stuff like that. And because he's interested in Madison and he's still also looking for Emily, he manages to get three interviews with people that'll help him find this. He interviews a friend of the murdered scientist couple to see if there's any clue towards Emily in that mess. And this is important because this is the only time science is mentioned in this book. This interview with the scientist that happens around like 150 pages. We also interview a random person, random person I don't even care to remember, but they have an interesting report too. There's this other guy in this book. I don't remember his name, but things like Patrick Corley. So Patrick, he died seven years ago in a grocery store, but he's been cited recently. So David goes to interview the lady who literally saw him die, I think. Or maybe it's the lady who saw him when he was supposed to be dead. Anyways, we got this zombie going around basically. But because he's dealing with Madison who looks like Emily, he's like, correlation? People coming back to life? Let me investigate it. And then we have this one other interview with this jerkwad. I don't know why we interview him. I just remember him saying, I could hammer nails with my So yeah, that was a lovely impression. He apparently saw Emily, or at least a strange woman that I don't know why, but he was just like skulking around this old decrepit looking house. And he just sees this woman just chilling in a chair and like blank face in a trance staring right ahead. Jerkwad guy goes into the house, 
Something happens. He doesn't explain what yet, but he says that when he was running out of the house, the hallways just got weird. Like it kind of warped around him. And David, our writer guy, he's like, dude, explain more. Mr. Jerkwad's like, mm -mm, ain't telling nothing. So we have those three interviews. They were very riveting. They were not riveting. It was also during one of these three interviews that someone said she looked as serious as a blow-up sex doll. I don't know what that means. Oh, and I forgot to mention, there's also a fourth interview. You remember the serial killer guy's house? Well, he's in prison now. So this guy, his name is Ultrich. He's like one of those unhealthily obsessed with, you know, serial killer guys. He bought the property and he like does tours on the land. Like in this room, um, a girl had her legs chopped off. Yes, yes, you can see the blood stains. So David paid for a tour there. So he can like look around the area for some clues because he's still like maybe Emily was killed in this area. Our boy is very spread thin. So I'm sure a bunch of like middle book stuff happens middle of the book, but I can't remember. But I do know our guy is kind of out of leads. So he has to play his trump card. He has to go back to the serial killer because the mysterious Madison is out of the picture. There's reports of this other Patrick guy who's supposed to be dead walking around. He's going nowhere with his investigation with Emily. So the only one who might have the answer is this Mr. Serial Killer Guy. So David rationalizes in his brain that if he gives Serial Killer Guy a personal bit of information about himself, then Serial Killer Guy will do the same and tell him what happened to Emily. So when David goes to the jail to sit down with Jessup, he's like, bro, this is why I'm so obsessed with finding Emily. When we were dating, I don't know, something crazy happened and I had a weak moment and I had an affair with someone. This boy is literally obsessed with Emily. This is not consistent with his character. I thought he was actually lying at this point to like bait Jessup into being interested in his story so that he'll spill the details about what happened to Emily, but no, it's like something that happened. I cannot voice enough just how much of Emily is made up of this guy's thoughts. So the fact that he cheated on her, it, it's, it's sloppily written into the book, but it kind of works, at least with the serial killer guy. He's so intrigued with the story that writer guy is telling that he's like, you know, bro, I don't know if I killed Emily. There was a lot of girls, okay, but I will tell you where I hid the other 14 bodies that I mummified so I can bring back to life as my harem of brides. They're still in the house, the one that the creepy Ultrich guy bought. Yeah, like, there's a basement under the basement. You just gotta finagle your way in there. Jessup tells David how to do it. So now David has a plan. Go down into the basement basement, look at these dead bodies and see if one of them resembles Emily. So then, he goes back to his house, he has a little bedtime, then he has this dream. But this isn't really a dream, it's a flashback from Emily's point of view. This does not make narrative sense. How is he dreaming about something Emily saw? It's the night that Jessup, the serial killer, did attack her when her car broke down on the side of the road. This is what I wrote. Now there's a flashback, but it's not really a flashback because he's dreaming, but he's dreaming from her point of view. But how's he doing that? He's not Emily. And the book is treating it like this actually happened. But how does he know this? And it's unclear if David is actually in the flashback because it's like his dream avatar is sitting in the backseat. And because this book is so poorly written, it's like he's actually there in the backseat. So half the time I'm like, are you really there? And then I'm like, why aren't you doing anything, bro? Your girlfriend's being attacked. Because I don't know if he's really there or not in the flashback. And it's just a confusing mess, but basically, Jessup attacked Emily when her car broke down the side of the road. She managed to hit him a couple times with a crowbar and it leaves off with like her very mortally wounded but still alive. And she's just crawling off to the distance and Jessup kind of, he's hurt too, so he runs off. So we don't know if she died in a ditch or something, if Jessup went back to collect her, or if she recovered and she's somewhere out there, namely as Madison. So he has that dream flashback thing. David goes back to the creepy serial killer house. He sneaks in because he doesn't want Ultrich, the guy who owns the property, to know he's there and try to stop him. He doesn't inform the police because he feels like that'll take months for them to excavate the property so they can see where the mummies are. So he goes in the secret way that serial killer guy told him and he finds the room full of mummies. And handily enough, they have all their names carved out on a plaque by their feet. None of them have Emily's name on it. And before he can get to like peeling back their faces to make sure none of them are actually Emily, he hears like commotion, living commotion in another room. It's Ultrich. 
he's in the basement, but not the basement basement, the above basement. And David's like, oh, well, I know like this path because serial killer guy told him it leads to the living room. So I'll just go that way and I'll completely like just skirt around Ultrich. But when David's on his way to get out of the place, he hears a girl screaming. So he's like, oh my gosh, Ultrich, because he's obsessed with Jessup. He's gonna like, he bought this property so he can reenact the killings and this is his first victim. So now David, he runs up to Ultrich, who is sitting in a recliner and he stabs the man. He was just watching a horror movie. I mean, the guy is a creep, but it's his property. If he feels like watching a horror movie in a basement with girls who are killed, that's his prerogative. So our protagonist has killed an innocent man. And with his two knives and the gun he stole from Ultrich, Ultrich's corpse, David gets the gun and he goes back to, you remember Mr. I can nail nails in with my f that guy, you remember him? Well, remember how I told you he was holding something back about the girl who was just staring vacantly in a vacant house? So David with his gun now, he just kicks in the door, goes right up to Mr. Jerkwad, pushes him down, puts the gun to his face or something. He's like, tell me about that girl. And Mr. Jerkwad, who is a jerk, is appropriately freaking out. And then this is where the sci-fi twist kind of comes in. You, you remember that? So Mr. Jerkwad, prone on the floor, he tells David what he saw in that house. Remember, he went into the house and we thought he was just going in to, you know, check on the girl who was just staring straight ahead. No, when he was peeping through the window at her, he was like, man, that's a fine looking specimen right there. Mm-hmm, I want a blowjob bad. So he goes up to her, takes this comatose woman, sexually assaults her by, you know, putting her head down there. But as he's grabbing the back of her head, he feels something metal and he looks and it's like, not quite a metal plate. He said it's like a socket, like a power outlet. And when he touches it, it like makes the girl jump. Like she's back to life and she's like, oh my gosh, get off me, bro. So she pushes him off. He runs the hallway like warps and stuff like that. And now we're back in the present where um, David holding the gun on him. David too is like, what kind of drugs were you on that night, man? And Mr. Jerkwad's like, I won't, I won't own nothing but California weed. So now David's head is spinning, okay? The girl Jerkwad assaulted, it looks so much like Emily, or it could have been Madison. Madison is still missing. So is Emily. Old Trich is dead, but he just has one final clue. That house that the Jerkwad broke into. Now this is where it got a bit fuzzy, because I was still like reeling from the socket in the back of her head thing. So I don't actually know if he goes to that house the Jerkwad broke into or just some house that somehow David knew about, but he goes to this final location because we're at the end of the book. We got 50 pages left and he feels like, I think all the answers are here. So then he goes to this house and sure enough, he finds Madison. We also remember Mr. Zombie guy who was supposed to be dead seven years ago, but has been walking around. He's here too. So is another woman who's been, I don't remember. I don't, I didn't remember her at all, but she was mentioned in the book, I think. And she's dead, but there's someone who looks like her right over there. So David sees this collection of supposed to be dead people. And he's like, uh, please explain. And so am I. Someone please tell me what's going on. So Madison takes David away. She's like, this is what we are. We are assassins, but from the future, the scientists of your time have ruined the timeline of the future. So much genetic manipulation. It has, we don't even look like humans anymore, man. Life is horrible. The ones who are so disfigured by the experimentations have a wretched life. I am one of those people, which is like, what do you mean, girl, you hot? But yeah, she's supposed to be a monster in the future, but she looks like a woman. Here, I don't know. <laughs> and David's like, what do you mean you look like a monster? So that's when she says that her actual body is in the basement below in a little pod that's controlling this, her good looking body. That's what the thing in the back of her head is. So David's like, are you controlling Emily's body? She's like, well, we made a clone of her body. We found her almost dead on the side of the highway. So we put her in suspended animation and we made this meat suit for me. And David's like, huh, well that's swanky. Well, can you give me back Emily? Madison from the future, I hate this book. She's like, no, because I have her body now, I have all of her memories and I have come to love you. You will be mine. So then there's this epic fight between them. It's not epic. He just shoots her. And because David is shooting up the place again, one of the future, 
time traveling assassin people gets the real Emily out of the suspended animation pod, gives her to David. They walk out of the house, but not before David blows up the house. Yeah, he had bombs on him this entire time. I forgot to mention that. And that's it. Emily and David just pick up where they left off. This was the stupidest book I've ever read. You know, if something has a cool sci-fi twist at the end, that is great. But you can't just mention this freaky science one time in the book, have like 200 pages of non-science stuff happen, and then suddenly drop back into the science fiction elements. If you wanted to write science fiction and a thriller at the same time, why not lean more on that science fiction? Show us this awful future that had people coming back to the past to kill the scientists that ruined the future. I'm like, I was reading a, this book with my friend and I was telling her the plot while I was reading each other. This is the most random thing ever. It is like, I don't know what the direction of this book is. I got nothing out of it, but a bunch of like wrinkles. Like I'm just scrunching my head like this, like what the heck? Second worst book I've read this year. Good gosh, I hate it. <laughs> I don't think I want to read this author ever again because I'm kind of scarred. You know, I don't want to sound mean, but I am just puzzled. So that's what where I'm speaking from. But how does something like this get published? Is it just because it's a best-selling author and they could literally poop out a rock or something, wrap up a bow on it, and sell it for a million dollars? That was a horrible analogy. See what this book has done to me? It's contaminated my creative brain. I need to go play Pokemon. I need happiness back in my life. I must find the aha moment with a really good thriller. Riley Sayer came out with a new book. I got it right on my desk. So I'm gonna read that. So y'all, thanks so much for letting me rant. This book was dumb, but I'm kind of dumb sometimes too. Maybe we could bleed each other. But this has helped ease the pain. At least got a good video out of it. Hope you enjoyed the nonsense. Stay reading, my friends.